and welcome back to the OMG MotoGP podcast, your San Marino preview episode. Before we get into this episode, though, I want to tell you all about our exclusive offer coming to our Patreon members. Do you guys want to get up close and personal with your favorite OMG guests? Well, sign up to our Patreon and you'll get VIP access to our live streams of our podcast recordings with our special guests. You could be chatting with MotoGP riders or have your questions answered by some top MotoGP legends. So check out the Patreon link in the description and we'll see you guys in the live chat. But back nope. to the wow. show, alongside myself, Renita Vermeulen, is a man who's been in MotoGP so long, they you should are. name a corner oh. after him. He's raced, he's commentated, right. and I bet he could still beat us all on a scooter. Yeah. It's Mr. Keith Hewen. Keith, <laughs> are you still in Thailand? <laughs> I am still in Thailand, as you can tell. I'm actually in an Irish bar at the moment. <laughs> an Irish oh, bar in Thailand. I love Irish it. bar in Thailand. There's plenty of them indeed. And have a corner named after me. I'm not sure about that. Maybe a block of toilets. That might be more appropriate. I'm not sure. <laughs> but we've got plenty to talk about with Mizano coming up this weekend. That's for sure. We have got plenty to talk about. Obviously, we're at the first race of two weekends at Mizano, and it's a VR46 Academy territory. Do you think we're in for another Ducati dominated weekend? Yeah, I think almost certainly we are. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you talk about VR46, 20 minutes up the road is to Vulio, the headquarters of VR46 is where everything's based. Everybody, you know, it's like a pilgrimage. Everybody goes up to Tavulia to go and have a look and then either walks down or rides down or cycles down to the to the track down the road. Named after Marco Simoncelli, who lived at Catolica, which is about five minutes up the road. Um, obviously, Paolo Simoncelli, his dad, had a hand in that as well. This place has got so much history attached to it. It's actually slightly scary, I've got to say. Yeah. Tommy Zawa, uh, Shoya Tommy Zawa, um, 2010 was, was was killed here. I remember it was one of the most sad moments we have. This is the place that, that ended Wade Rainey's fourth world title, it looked like, back uh, in the day. I think, when was that? 93, I wrote it down here somewhere. Yeah, it was 93, what a long time ago that was to the day that Tommy Zauer was killed, as it, as it turns out. So um, it's it's a, a place steeped in history. But for me, the, 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 the saddest at the moment, if you can get any sadder than that, is it's a year since Mike Trimby passed away. So um, have a thought for all the Urta guys. They'll be in the same hotel, sitting at the same dinner table that Mike passed away at a year ago. Uh, that's a moment in time that we've all got to think about to some extent. And also... We've got to think of, you know, Mike has been inducted into into the Legends uh, Hall of Fame, if you like, now. He's the, he's the only non-MotoGP rider that's uh, that's been inducted as a legend. He was also posthumously awarded the highest distinction the FIA could give um, an individual as well. So that leads us on to the fact that he will have had a hand in the build-up, I suppose, to the... The, the 2060 that the FIM have just signed Dorna for as promoters for MotoGP as well. That's just been announced that, that there's a long-term contract between Dorna and the FIM, which stabilizes anything that might not have been so stable for Liberty um, Media, who are the ones that are going to be, I'm fairly sure, once it's signed off, eventually signed off, um, the owners of the sport. So I think all these things are going into place. There's a lot, it's honor. There's a lot to talk about. Anything you particularly want to pick on, fire away. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about the fact that Pecco is coming into this year injured again. Same thing happened last year. Obviously, last year was that crazy crash at Catalonia beforehand that just is totally mind-blowing. But he's coming back into his home race again injured. Jorge Martin has the lead. Is, is this enough for Jorge Martin to maintain that lead going in or do you think it's just because it's it's Peko's home track that even though he's not feeling 100% he's still going to be on top? Well as we saw going into Aragon with that muscle memory and the success that Peko had had, Bangaya had had at Aragon, he was going to be the man at Aragon. The same thing applies here for Jorge Martin coming off the back of that double last year so he's going to go into this round thinking I can really steal a march on Bangaya here, I can really rub that injury in. Okay, it's not a terrible injury, but any injury. It's funny how we make light of these things, don't we? I mean, like, he's rolled up a road, he's had a motorcycle that's, that's rubbed him into the tarmac. 
and, 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 and people sort of just shrug it off. We look at it as, a, as almost a normal thing. These guys are almost like superhuman step up for it. But, yeah, if I fell off a bar stool in, this, in here, where I am at the minute, I'd probably, I'd probably feel the pain. The point is, is that at this time of the year, most of these guys are carrying some kind of injury somewhere at some, some stage. And because of, as you quite rightly mentioned, the back-to-back -back nature of when we are in MotoGP at this time of the year, you pick up an injury now and it can wreck two, three Grand Prix. Uh, and that is really what Bengai does not need at this particular point. He will have calmed down after Aragon. He will have taken stock. He will have got a, got a grip on himself for, should we say, um, the psychological side of things. He will have gotten that sorted out, I'm fairly sure. So... The injury, yeah, it will affect him to a point, but yeah, they, they'll have got over that by the time we get to racing on uh, Saturday and Sunday. Keith, I saw that Michelin are bringing another option front tyre this weekend, a harder option. Coming from Aragon where it was, I guess, a lack of grip, most of the riders were saying we're coming to Mizano now, which is a grippier track. How much more are the guys really pushing on the front that they they do need to have that harder front tire? It's the problem you've got with the amount of aero they've got and the pace that they're carrying. It depends whereabouts they are in the pack. You know, uh, you know so much now hinges on qualifying. You know, Marquez had a perfect qualifying in Aragon on a very difficult track. He got a great start, which he didn't. If you remember back at uh, Red Bull Ring when he completely mucked up the the uh, the, the shapeshifter. He hadn't got it in place at the start, so therefore he blew the start and had it coming together with Morbidelli. You know, so many little things hinge on nuances of, of, of qualifying and, and setup. Front tyres, they've always been an issue. They're just a bigger issue now with, with the like of aero and the weather and where you're going to be in the pack. You know, it's almost trying to predict who's going to be about, how much temperature you're going to pick up in that front, front tyre and where you're going to be in the race. Um, Michelin is trying to combat that to some extent and I don't think we've had anything like the tyre penalties I was expecting this year so far um, whether that gets a little bit more critical at places like Mizano and we pick up penalties more I mean Mizano is one of them ones where you, you know track limits is a problem you're always picking up track limit warnings here the little bits of green paint that you know the one that annoys the hell out of me I always remember having this row with Gavin Emmett on, you know, on TNT now for BT back in the day over this little bit of green paint that they come onto the, out of the Mizano corner, the left hander, onto the start and finish straight. It's just a, you just let the bike roll out. It's, it, it, you, there's no advantage. There's no there's no problem with anything to do with it. But they've just got this little triangle of green paint. God, it used to piss me off looking at that. And, ri and riders would would just run over it just because you wouldn't be even thinking about it because it's not really a track limit that's going to have an effect on anything to do with anything at all, other than the fact that if you do it too many times, you're going to pick up a penalty and a long lap to go with it. Um, and, and Mizano has a couple of areas like that where you just can't, especially on the last lap, you cannot afford to be running off onto the green anywhere. Else. Um, it's going to cost you dear. So a few little a few little things that are annoying that, have, that riders have got to keep you know, in their mind. So we know that the Ducatis are going to be strong. Is this a track where we might see that difference again between the GP23s and the GP24s? Well, you know, it's funny how I love watching comments that you get on Twitter and the like. I mean, it's, it's a, everyone's an expert. Um, there is a big difference in racing terms between the GP23 and the GP24. That's a fact. You know, I don't care how many people argue it otherwise. It is a fact. You know, when Frankie Carcetti sends me a text message to say that wait till he's on the 24, you won't believe him. Uh, yeah, these guys, are they live and breathe alongside these motorbikes. They know the differences. It doesn't matter what we say. Quite often, we are repeating what we hear from our friends and family in the paddock, um, who are the experts. You know, I'm just a conduit of, of information. If I pick up a bit of information, I'll give it to OMG Motor GP people. Um, but there's no disputing it. If I'm saying it, it's because truthfully it has come from a source that knows what they're on about. And so if somebody's saying that there's such a big difference between the 23 and 24 Ducati, I believe every word of it. It just happens that Mark Marquez is an exceptional human being uh, and managed to get the best out of a bike that wasn't a favourite on a track that wasn't in anything like great condition. He did a, an alien's job. That no one could quite understand. You know, the comments around the paddock were just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, mouths open and 
full respect to market. Um, so we'll see. But I mean, the 24 is still the, is the bike. Um, Bang Nai, our provider, he's not hurt too badly. Will be somewhere thereabouts. And Jorge so hey, Martin, I've got down for a win. Get some predictions. Of the but I, I think Martin is, um, is, is, I think he's, again, but you can make a mistake at these tracks. You know, there are a couple of places here that, that, that the penalty don't fit the crime. You pay a massive penalty if you mess up at Mazzano. What about Anaya and Marco Bezzecchi then? So Anaya's from a stone's throw away, Rimini, right? Like 20 minutes up the road. But then also Marco Bezzecchi last year, he was on the podium twice. Do you think these guys are going to have a strong chance again this weekend? I, I mean, Bezzecchi, he's going to have to bring his A game if he's going to do that. And maybe he will. I mean, there's nothing like home Grand Prix again. You know, you, <laughs> home Grand Prix is about winning or choking, one or the other. Um, and it's about a 50-50 shout for a lot of riders. You, know, you get to the home Grand Prix and choke, or you get to the home Grand Prix and have a, have a podium finish. Um, Bezzecchi could easily um, put it on the podium. Bastianini I'm quite keen for, I've got to say, I've got him in my running as well, uh, when we get down to that. It, and he needs, you know, Bastianini needs a ride, really, to make it work for him. Bezzecchi, I haven't got in the top three anywhere. I've got Mark up there again. Um, but I think, based on what we're seeing, the maturity and the standard of riding from, from Jorge Martin, and obviously, historically, from last year, having such a good year, and that's in his head as well. He knows how to do it. Mizano, I think. <laughs> I've just ruined his weekend by the sound of it by predicting for him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we can tick Ducati off the list because we've talked about them. We know that they're going to be quite strong. What about, I just want to touch on the KTM and the Aprilias. Is this a track, the Aprilias in particular, and I'm thinking more like Miguel Oliveira and maybe Maverick Vinales. Is this a track that we could see them closer to the front? Well, they're unpredictable at the minute, and I don't, I, you know, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, Danny Pedrosa last year came here as a wild card, as a test rider, and ended up in a fourth place. You know, he, he had a, an absolutely incredible ride. I mean, it just goes to show you just the, the mark of the man that Danny is. And, you know, at the time, we were crediting him as a test rider with a whole load of KTM's, you know, vigour with their performance where they were at. But since then, you know, they basically have found a struggle. And, and of recent times, so have Aprilia. Now, whether they can turn something around in the lights of Mizano, I don't know. It's a tricky old track, that's for sure. And weather and grip are, are directly related. And we'll find out whether they, they can make that work. But they're all due. And they're all capable. And they're all within a second of each other most of the time. So, um, <laughs> get your heads down, boys. <laughs> get on with it. So, okay, as a... As a fan who's watching watching the track, in your opinion, what are the corners that we need to be mindful of, or where where are the the best overtaking is it turn one after the straight is what which there way are, do you there, think? There are massive opportunities, though most riders will argue there are no opportunities anymore because there's only one line, there's only one faster line, just about everywhere now. But, but there are opportunities here. I mean, in 2006, they turned it clockwise. It used to be anti-clockwise, so the corner that is Turn 11, I think it is now, Covona, I think that's cool. Um, this is from memory, so you look it up. But the <laughs> circuitinfo.com is where you need to go, I think it is. Circuit Info, it's got all of the, the maps. Of the, well, my, some kind of delivery service for this. Last week we had seatguru.com, now we're on circuitinfo.com. But there is a, a website that brilliantly has all of the racetracks, all of their configurations throughout the years, and a, and a short uh, pricey of, of information regarding it. And you can look it up, it's online, it's free. Um, every track in the world, no matter what it is, um, they have got all the information. Even when pit lanes change and, and so on and so forth, it tells you everything. Um, so take a look, little bit of a look at that because it's interesting from Rosano's point of view. But in 2006, it went clockwise as opposed to anti clockwise. When I rode it, it was anti clockwise. Um, which meant that the three main corners, well, I think of the three main corners, are now the flat stick and everything except for GP, uh, right hander of turn 11, which is Cavone. Then you've got, um, it slows down 12, 13. You're getting slower through the corner, so you're actually scrubbing off speed and slowing yourself down as you come around to the last hairpin and, and a couple of left handers. So it's actually, I think, trickier now than it was before. Before it used to build, build, build big slides and all the rest of it. Now it's all on the front end. 
and trying to work it through to that final breaking. And, and yeah, you can you can force a move in the last couple of corners here for sure. There are a couple of block passes available. So if you're close enough, um, you can uh, force it to fix it at the end of a race. So it's from basically turn 11 Cavone working it out how you're going to make the pass in the last three corners. There's opportunities. Um, those are also big crashing opportunities, by the way. And we do see quite a lot of them. The final corner, it's, you know, it don't look fast when you look at it on a map. But when they're sliding up the road, you can see how fast the Mizano corner is. It's quite a quick old turn. Well, you alluded to it earlier, so let's get on to it. What's your prediction for the sprint on Saturday? Let's start with the sprint. I'll be quick, and I wrote them down. Jorge Martin, Peco, and Mar Marquez. They're my three. Uh, okay. For the sprint. Um, for the GP, I've got Peco, Martin, Bastianini. So I've got Peco winning a long race. We'll see. Uh, I mean, these predictions are almost, you know, they're just fun because that's all they can be. Arrogant. Yeah, maybe you could have predicted Mark Marquez having a, having his first win, but could you have predicted him being as incredibly dominant as that? I mean, I'm still breathless at, the, at, at what he achieved uh, last time. Uh, I don't believe he's going to do that every week. I think it was a combination of the fact that, A, it's Mark Marquez, the 23, may have just suited the conditions that were there, and the, 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 the renewed track surface um played into it plus the fact it rained every night so every time you had a, a green track when you arrived in the morning so the circumstances of Aragon were completely different than what I think will get a Mizano um, the last uh, weather forecast I looked at sort of looks stable what most riders and teams need want pray for is stable conditions when you arrive there on a Friday those conditions yeah you don't want it to change by a degree you don't want the weather you just you want it to stay stable so that you have got a platform that you can work to and keep making the adjustments to you've got the perfect perfect package um but slinging slinging a bit i mean we've had rain at bizarro before um that, that's sort of messed up the entire uh, game for a lot of people and it's given real opportunities to others i think it's got red in bradley smith we talk about brits since i'm uh, normally sitting in britain Instead of 35 degrees sunshine. Oh. Eat your heart but you're out. in an Irish bar, so it's kind of the same, right? Yeah. Hang on a second. Drinking tea. <laughs> <laughs> you can take They're the gonna, Brit out of England. They're going to throw me out in a minute. There is a, <laughs> actually, hang on a second. Okay. Yes, there is a Guinness sign in here. Oh, no, it's Bailey's. Bloody hell. <laughs> oh, dear me. It's not even a bloody... <laughs> oh, Keith. <laughs> Maybe it's the kind of bar I didn't think it was. <laughs> we won't go there, will we? We touched on the Brits, and let's just jump down to Moto2 real quick. Jake Dixon heading into this weekend. Obviously, that confidence from the win last weekend is going to help him. What's your thoughts for him going into Mazzano this weekend? I I haven't spoken to Jake. I, haven't, I think I had a quick text message session with um, Sally, uh, Sarah's mum. Um, I'm really, really hope he's able to put it together on a consistent basis. I mean, like right now, he's on fire. He's on fire. Um, and we really need that. He really needs that to continue. I mean, I was a bit disappointed with some of the, the, the comments made about Jake. You know, he's 28 years old, rah, 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 he's passed it. Yeah, that, 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 that. factories want to hire fast men consistently fast men that can give them feedback and Jake is into that domain moved into that domain. he is fast if he can put this year together properly yeah there are one or two riders that are on one year contracts next year I mean it's tricky isn't it? he's gonna to have to get lucky to get himself a motor GP ride in the short term but if he can keep plugging away at it, if he can pick off a world title I mean it's still there. It can still be done, but he's going to have to have a bit of luck in his favour and he is going to have to be the man every weekend to make that work. But blimey, he's looking very... That ride in Aragon was beautiful. Yeah, some people, they look shock their shoulders and not look at it in the same way, but you know, he was under pressure from Arbolino. He had control of Arbolino. Arbolino in second place was keeping him, in, keeping him honest all the way through. And then he banged in them a couple of laps just to break that toe at a critical time late on in the race. Maturity, speed, class. Jake had it all last week. And if he can continue in that vein, there's no reason to say he can't, um, then we're there. 
you know, it's it's something Sam Lowe's could win races, but he just couldn't quite make that click where it was consistent all of the time. If Jake can just make that step and keep it flowing in the top three, doesn't have to win everybody out there, he just has to be in the top three. Preferably win everyone, Jake, if you would, please. Thank you very much. But podium will do. <laughs> podium, podium will suffice. But no, I know what you mean. I think we're seeing that a little bit with Sergio Garcia and Joe Roberts where that MotoGP ride was almost in reaching distance for them. They didn't get it. And then you could start to see, I guess, like their mentality crumble a little bit. Obviously, Sergio Garcia just had a terrible weekend last weekend. Joe Roberts as well with with the track house rider falling through, you could say. It just seems like that edge is missing. Like they're almost deflated, you know? Hell of a lot going on in your head in Grand Prix nowadays. This is not, you know, it's not a, 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 an easy sport. It's, it's one that, that, you know, psychologically, physically, every other way you can possibly imagine. You have to be on top of your game every single minute of the, of the time you're out on track. It's uh, and, and, and not on track as it happens. You know, to keep your head in line. A lot of comments about Pecco, you know, losing his rag last time out. And you can see a bit of frustration coming through. I, I don't think that's a, an inherent trait of Pecco's. I think that is just, he had a frustrating weekend. He wasn't where he wanted to be. Okay, he qualified okay in the end, but it was a struggle to get. He was on his back foot all the way through the weekend. And then the accident, you know, with Alex Marquez, which we can go back over if you like. I mean, you know, people have said, oh, it was Pecco's fault, he should have known this, and, and then Alex, and people will say it was Alex's fault, he should have known that. At the end of the day, it was completely, it was a racing incident. I mean, I think I gave it 40% Pecco, 60% Alex's fault. And the reasoning behind that for me was that, you know, Alex ran wide. He'd lost the corner, he'd run wide. But then, of course, that gives you an opportunity to get on the gas in a different way. So he was closing on Pecco but he hadn't got enough momentum to get under him so that everybody could have got through the turn okay. So I could see why they deemed it a racing incident. Nobody got penalised. Move on, folks. Nothing to see here. We're going to get on with it. Um, Bagnoia probably justifiably saw it. You know, Alex was a bit keen underneath him. And out of the two of them, really, Bagnoia had no chance. He wouldn't have seen him. He wouldn't have known anything about it until he felt him wrap underneath it. Alex had a, a millisecond of chance just to roll it a bit earlier and maybe give Pecco the line to come through. You know, one guy's going to be coming down to the line and the other guy, if he sees a gap, he's going to be trying to force it underneath him. And that's all that happened. You know, and like I say, move on. It's one of those things. They'll both get over it. They'll have to. And if the same situation presents itself at any other track in the future, exactly the same result is going to come out of it. Um, yeah, two riders are going to come together. We've seen it so many times. Um, I'm just trying to think of a racetrack where I think it was Hareth where we had everybody at, is it Danny Pedrosa Corner? Danny was involved in it, I think, where we had two or three or four. So, you know, same thing. You know, one's on the line going for the gap, one's on the line coming for the apex. It's something you get in motorbike racing. There's no legislation against it, so the stewards did the right job. I see uh, uh, some interesting comments as well about Simon Crayford um, getting the steward's job for, for for coming up in the in the in the future. Uh, I don't know why it is that, that we seem compelled to criticise every single thing that is happening at every single minute of every single day. Um, why would anybody want to be criticising Simon Crayford at this particular point before he's actually got his feet under the table of the steward's office? I personally think that Simon Rafael will make a very good job. He's a hard man. He comes across as a softy, but he definitely is not softy. So uh, I think we're in for some great times next year. But before next year, we have San Marino this weekend. And before we wrap things up, Keith, I want to hear from you. Who is a rider that we should be keeping our eyes out on this weekend? Acosta again. I mean, you talked, you asked me about KTM earlier on. You know, KTM in the gas gas guys as it is for for, for a cost of, for out of tech three uh Herve team you know he had that i won't call it a lump but it was just that dip of realization that hey i'm a rookie i'm in both gp and i can't keep that tra trajectory of going straight up as he was he, i mean he, he like blew us all out of the water with his early season performances 
then it just leveled out a little bit. Had to take stock of where they were going and what they were doing. Maybe they've made some adjustments that haven't quite worked for him. And, you know, he's working his way through the form book of, of how to adjust a KTM to, to suit him and the tracks that they're at. But I think Acosta, we are still going to see more from him this year. Uh, and Rizzano again, the KTM has worked there before. I'm going to go a little bit left field here with my answer to that question. Um, I'm going to say Maverick Vinales this weekend. I just feel like he he's, he needs to have a good weekend. We know this. <laughs> we know that Maverick needs to have a good weekend. I'm just wondering if this is a weekend where he might just get his act together. Maybe the rear grip's going to suit him. Maybe this track. I don't know. I've just got this feeling. I, I just get fed up with doing that and saying that <laughs> for Maverick because you, you just sort of lay your, you pin your colours to the mast and about Maverick because he's a super talented rider. And when all his ducks are in a row, the guy's there. But for some reason, he always bloody lets us down. Um, you know, you, you, it's it's the Morbidelli situation. It's the Maverick Vignale situation. You know, two fantastically talented riders, but just not quite able to give us our predictions <laughs> well, funny that you mentioned Morbidelli because I actually think that he might be on the podium this weekend go on then give us your prediction yeah all right so I wrote them down so I've got Banyaya first obviously um Jorge Martin and I think Morbidelli in third not a bad shout I've got to say well I mean it's hard to go past Peko and Martin right now <laughs> what about that what about the sprint um no, that, that was for the uh, sprint, sorry. Sorry, yeah, that was my sprint. And then my Grand Prix, I would put Bastianini in third. So it'd be the same, Pecco, Martin, Bastianini in third. Or you got the same with me. Yeah, pretty much the same. I think that for Pecco, the win here is going to be good, but I also think the consistency, you know, Jorge Martin's finished second, second, like the last three Grand Prix in a row. So that consistency, I think, for him is going to be key to be that that little bit of the edge on Peko right now. You know what? And we've got such a lot coming up here on OMG MotoGP that all those guys that are going to join us on Patreon in the future are going to be able to argue with us. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> wait. So. <laughs> Guys, if you are still listening now, yes, like I said earlier, we have something exciting coming up on our Patreon when you can jump in live with our recording of the show. So head on to that link, which is below in the description, um, and you can sign up to our Patreon. But from myself and Keith, we're going to be back in a few days to chat all the on-track action. And if you miss us so much, you can head over to our socials at OMG MotoGP on all the platforms to catch up with all the latest news. Or if you have a question for us and you can't wait for the live chat, you can email us at OMGMotoGP at gmail.com. But for, for now, guys, we will be back in a few days with our post San Marino Grand Prix episode. And I'm off to get a Guinness.